Hi, everyone. I'm very excited for today's presentation. And the reason for that is that in September of 2020, I attended a Science Moab webinar entitled Rethinking Science in the Southwest, Creating an Inclusive Science to Address Human Health and Environmental Change. And during that, Sergio Avila, a wildlife biologist with the Sierra Club, was one of the feature speakers. And his presentation where he pointed out racist underpinnings of idolized conservation figures and his own firsthand experience of racial injustice in this country had a lasting impact on me and my programming. So Sergio has lived and worked in the Te'ono Odom and Pascua Yaqui ancestral lands in Arizona since 2004. He became a US citizen in 2016. And I'm very glad to hear that. I'm actually in the process of applying as well as a Canadian uh, living in the United States. And he enjoys trail running, gardening, bird and butterfly watching, looking for wildlife tracks, and spending time with his wife, Jenny, their three cats, Lupe, Carlos, and Pancho, and Toby, the desert tortoise. So with that, I'll pass it over to Sergio. Thanks so much for taking the time today. Gracias, Roslyn. Gracias, Joanna, and everyone at the Department of Environment and Society. It is a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, especially knowing that um, a program uh, that we had before uh, got your attention. And so I'm very honored to share some space here with you and share some experiences. Um, and with that, uh, I actually want to start, I see that we have a really good uh, numerous audience. So I will invite everybody to connect uh, with, our, with our space and come into our space. Let's take a couple breaths together so we can get in sync with our mind and our heart. We're coming into this room and creating a container of trust and acceptance. And it also helps me uh, breathe a little bit before I start talking to you on all these uncomfortable things that I wanna talk to you about. Uh, just as uh, Rosalind said, my name is Sergio Avila. I use pronouns he, him, and I am coming to you today from the ancestral lands of the Toono Odam and Pascua Yaqui people. Um, it, is, it is a beautiful morning, a beautiful afternoon here in the Sonoran Desert. And uh, I want to talk to you today about what it is equity and inclusion and what my experience has been as a scientist, as an immigrant to this country, and as a person of color, and all what is called as the intersections of race, gender, and um, socioeconomic class, not only in this country, but also where I come from. Um, as I said before, I am here in the lands of the Odam people. These are lands and these are people who have lived in this region for many, many millennia. And uh, recently they have been defending their lands from arbitrary political lines drawn by somebody else in a different place. And what I mean recently is the last 300 or 400 years, basically they have been, uh, these borders and these people in this region have been under attack. I will talk more about it in my presentation. This is me. Uh, the person that you say, it's me. Uh, it is both, it is many, many things. I am a, a heterosexual male. I identify as a male. Um, I am a crazy cat person. I do believe that I speak cat very well. Uh, cats have told me that sometimes. And uh, my origins, I am originally from the country of Mexico. I grew up in the ancestral lands of Zacateco people, the people of the grasslands. And interestingly, in a coincidence with Utah, um, I grew up in a place where the land is red, where dirt is red. And uh, for some reason, every time I see it, especially in some areas in Utah, Northern Arizona, it becomes very familiar to me, so it feels good to it feels good to be in a place where we can connect through the land. Also, as part of me, I am a husband, I am an uncle, I am an immigrant, I am a trail runner, I am an advocate for sustainability, sustainable practices. 
Um, you can see in the bottom left there, I am playing with my solar oven where I love to cook a bunch of different things, especially in the summer. Um, I come from a family of scientists. Both my parents are medical doctors in Mexico and my one brother is also a biologist also in Mexico. He has written two books uh, on the national symbols of Mexico, such as rattlesnakes and golden eagles. And the reason why I said this, I say this is because I grew up surrounded by science. I grew up with people who think uh, in scientific terms and in scientific methodologies and people who actually use science to solve problems. As, as, as medical doctors, my parents have used their science in order to make decisions to advise their patients and to uh, instill a healthy way of living. Um, so one thing that they taught me is that instead of using medical science to solve problems and cure people, they wanted to use medical science to prevent problems and, and promote health instead of promote cure. And if you see that, that's just a shift in a way of thinking that we have of the health system. Uh, and uh, as, a, as a biologist, I am a person who from a young age, I wanted to be a biologist. I wanted to study big cats. I had a dream of saving jaguars and saving lions. I in fact had a recurring dream as a child that uh, we had an African lion in my backyard, in our backyard, and I would go every day and feed it chicken bones or something. I, my dreams, of course, were not clear, but I do remember this lion that was big and I could stroke uh, its mane. And that really influenced how I grew up thinking of myself as a biologist and, and wanted to, to have a career in science. And um, as I said, I am from central Northern Mexico. So I'm not from what is known as the border region but as, as I moved north, I didn't move directly from my hometown in Zacatecas to the United States. I have lived in different places in Northwest Mexico in states bordering the United States where open space and wildlife uh, still have a presence. So my dream of studying big cats was combined with an opportunity to live in very far remote areas uh, in Northwest Mexico, where a lot of my scientific uh, background came to play, but also personal experience and new learnings played a role in the person and in the scientist that I am today. I have not written very much. I have not published very much about my studies with Jaguars uh, for different reasons that I might address here. But if you are curious about some of my, some of my publications, I invite you to look for the Jaguar and the PhD, which is a publication idea about, about a, a publication I had about uh, my own uh, graduate studies and uh, uh, an experience that I had while studying Jaguars. Uh, I can tell you very quickly, the Jaguar did not get the PhD. That's the, that's the end part of that, of that story. But as a scientist, as a wildlife biologist, I have always been very, very interested in learning more about wildlife and in learning ways to protect wildlife and to protect the corridors and the habitat. Especially as a biologist working with carnivores, I have been very focused on cats I, and I have been very focused on the food of cats. So when I'm studying cats, I look for deer, I look for javelina, I look for all the species that help those cats be in those places. And so I'm not just looking at the top predator but instead I'm looking at the system where this top predator lives and what needs this predator has to survive in those places. Throughout my life and throughout my career uh, of about 25 years of professional career, I have always worked for nonprofit organizations. I have not worked for government organizations or agencies and I have not worked for private agencies. So I do have a bias in the way of work uh, stemming from non-government, non-profit organizations and learning about the cycles of grant writing and these kind of studies that, that we do on a, on a cycle. So that's been my life for 25 years. So in addition to wildlife biology and using these cameras and enjoying wildlife tracking, I also have to know about strategic thinking. 
uh, grant writing, uh, relationships with foundations, all of those things have been fundamental, important for me to understand the world of conservation. The world of conservation does not stand by itself um, in one place, but instead is made of many different elements, such as foundations and government agencies, and of course, nonprofits. Uh, through this presentation, I will be sharing some of my personal experiences. I will not uh, pretend to be an expert on equity and inclusion. I am not a consultant, but I have had some interactions uh, and experiences both from my privilege as a scientist, my privilege as a, as a man, my privilege as an English speaker, as an able-bodied person. And also I have experiences uh, of uh, not oppression, but a little bit of uh, racial profiling and other uh, type of interactions where my person, as a person of color, as somebody who has an accent in English, uh, as somebody who just recently became a US citizen, has been on the receiving end of some uh, harm, also known sometimes as micro or macro aggressions. So I will be sharing some of those stories with you. I also wanna tell you that in addition to working at Sierra Club for the outdoor activities team, um, I am also a volunteer, a trustee with the Progressive Workers Union. This is a large union of staff members from different conservation organizations uh, such as the Sierra Club, Greenpeace, the, the uh, concern, Concerned Scientists, uh, the Union of Concerned Scientists, and 350.org. So I am a volunteer in the leadership of a union that addresses nonprofit organizations and the staff that work at the intersection of environmental justice and social justice. I am also a volunteer in the city of Tucson as a member in the Commission of Climate, Energy and Sustainability. And just recently, I became the chair of the Sugar Hill Neighborhood Association. That is the neighborhood association where, that is the neighborhood where I live. Sugar Hill is a historic black neighborhood that was uh, sort of started in Tucson around the 40s and 50s. And because of my interest in learning more and being more involved in social justice, I have taken these uh, voluntary positions at different levels where I put either my scientific background to work or my personal interest to work. What's important here that I want you to remember is that I don't take my hats off and on. I'm not wearing the hat of an immigrant one day and the hat of the Sierra Club another day. I wear them all together. In fact, I don't like to wear hats. So I'd rather, I like to wear a lot of uh, sweaters so I'd rather say I wear a lot of layers. I'm always an immigrant. I am always a hetero cisgender man. I am always from Mexico. I am always a citizen of the United States. I am always um, a scientist. So I don't wear different hats. All of those experiences come to me together and I use them in my work um, every day. I'm using them right now in this presentation. One of the things I want to share with you um, as a scientist is this, uh, I didn't discover anything, but I, it, it took me a while to understand and give credit during my research in very remote areas that not all knowledge is scientific. Not all knowledge is learned at a university with somebody lecturing you in a room. Not all knowledge comes from books. A lot of knowledge comes from our relationships and our connection to different communities. So sometimes if you are missing, um, if there's something you don't understand, if there's something you have never read, if there is something new you need to, you want to learn, you might not find those things in books, but instead you might find them in personal experiences, in personal interactions, especially in uh, relationships where you have created trust and you have a two-way communication. You are not uh, more intelligent than somebody else just because you're a scientist. Um, you are not smarter than anybody else because you have a PhD. You might talk different. You might have diplomas hanging on the wall. But what I have been able to learn from different communities on the ground in the places where I have studied jaguars or ocelots 
has been invaluable information that has saved me a lot of time and pretty much I would say has saved my life too. So creating trust with local communities. If you ask me, what should we do at the end of this presentation? This is number one, have relationships, start relationships, create trust with other communities, especially communities that you might not be familiar with. Uh, they still hold some knowledge that might be use, useful for you or that you might be able to improve through your science and through your work. In the two last photographs I showed you, it is photographs of local people who told me as I was studying Jaguars in the borderlands, where they thought some of the corridors were, where they thought that some of these animals might move. And now I'm showing you photographs resulting from that guidance. So I didn't ask scientists where to go look for Jaguars. I asked ranchers in Mexico where to go look for Jaguars and I found them thanks to their guidance. These four photographs of Jaguars are in one private property just 30 miles south of the international border. So if we have Jaguars 30 miles south of the US-Mexico border and a rancher is doing the practices and the management that allows the, that allows the system to work in a way that top predators will be there, then it's very important to give credit to this landowner, to this rancher, because it is thanks to them and their work that these jaguars are there. It is not a coincidence. It took a lot of time to finally get these jaguars. But in my mind, the, the appearance of these jaguars in the photographs, yes, I did publish it in an article. I did present it in a conference. Uh, it has my name, but I always credit the rancher, the land manager in that place, because these jaguars would not exist in that place without that family making space for them. So it's very important that we understand that there is no separation between wildlife, between natural places or nature in general and people. We need to understand our connection to the natural world in a way that doesn't make us seem separate from that natural world, but instead uh, in a way that makes us see where our intersection is. Here you are seeing a photograph of a mother jaguar with two cubs. This photograph was taken a few hundred miles from the international border. But this mother jaguar is in a safe, in a safe, pla safe place. Uh, it is, she is breathing and she is using human-made structures in order to access water, water that also benefits their prey. And so with that, we are showing how humans are not disconnected from these natural places and from these species. Again, uh, some of the species that I have seen throughout my research with those remote cameras is a lot of populations of deer and javelina, which are the main uh, prey species of jaguars and mountain lions as well. Um, it has been wonderful to see the diversity of species in different areas, uh, both in Northern Mexico and in the United States. Here in this photograph, you can see five different species and they're all in the same place. Notice there are two rocks in the bottom of the photograph. Uh, so there's two gray rocks. So you can see from a gray fox to an ocelot to a jaguar, um, skunks and coatis, a lot of these species come together in one place. This is their land. This is, uh, this is them saying we have what we need uh, and we are living we are living uh, with the resources that we need, with, the, with, with, with a system that sustains us. What's interesting is sometimes what gets lost in those uh, images or in, in, in what I feel is this communication of photographs. And so I remember when I first saw this photograph and it is the same spot with the two rocks in the bottom. When I first saw this photograph, I was still very focused on jaguars and um, I remember thinking about this deer thinking, oh man, there goes the tacos. This is the food for the jaguars. This is what we're looking for. Uh, this is very successful. I'm so happy, except I'm a little bo bothered that this photograph is not very crisp and it looks a little blurry because there's a lot of orange things flying around. Well, it turns out that this was during the fall migration of monarch butterflies from Canada to central Mexico and I happened to find them with my remote cameras 
um, in a remote canyon where jaguars, ocelots, and deer live also. So to me, that was also saying that even if these are some species that don't live there, if these are some migratory species, there is something in that place that they need. There is something in that place that they call home. And if we protect habitat for jaguars, we might benefit monarch butterflies or the other way around. If we protect some spaces for deer and or butterflies, we might be protecting habitat for jaguars. So this made it easy for me to move on from jaguars and start working on something else. And that was monarch butterflies. What was interesting with monarch butterflies is that they are a great example of a species that does not see borders. This is a truly migratory species that travels from central Mexico through uh, the Southwest United States, the Midwest, and then into Canada. But it is a fascinating migration uh, that uh, it's, a lot, it's a lot more complex to describe. So, if I am a butterfly, I, and I am a butterfly, that left central Mexico to um, do my migration, spring migration to the north, maybe the butterfly that left central Mexico is my great-grandmother. And then as my great-grandmother starts flying north and gets around the Texas border, my grandmother is born. And then my grandmother keeps traveling north, using the flowers, using the water, looking for the gardens, and gets to the Midwest, and my mother is born. And my mother keeps flying north and traveling until she gets to some places in Ontario, and I am born. So as a migrant, I did not do the whole trip, but I benefit from the efforts of each one of the generations before me to reach a place where I am going to be able to breathe, where I am going to be able to breed, where I am going to be able to connect with other butterflies in that place. So I'm saying this because this is similar to what happens and has happened for millennia with indigenous communities all throughout the Americas, all throughout Turtle Island, especially before there were these political boundaries. People have been traveling and migrating in different areas, following the resources that they need, following the water, following the flowers, maybe following the bison or the deer in order to get to other places where they will have good living conditions. And then maybe later they will return in the winter south. So in my example of my monarch family, I would be the, the butterfly. My generation would be the generation that flies back all those 4,000 uh, miles back into central Mexico and would start with me the next uh, wave of migration. So it's very important to understand that migration is a natural phenomenon. It's a natural phenomenon for, for, for animals. It is a natural phenomenon for humans. And if we see migration as a natural phenomenon for humans, we might be able to understand a little better what is going on with some human communities. And with some human communities, sometimes there are gardens where these migrants can reach, where they can find a safe space, where they can find the food and other needs to cover the needs that they have. And very importantly, those, uh, those gardens are not exclusive for monarchs, but those gardens host a whole a uh, set of different species of butterflies, of hummingbirds, of other pollinators, and the same thing with people. When people find those safe spaces, they will find each other, they will connect with each other and continue their natural movement. Back a little bit into the science of monarch butterflies. This is a very similar map to the one I showed you before but you can see a little bit more specificity in the colors, in the arrows, when the migration, the spring migration is north, the fall migration is south. Um, you can see that there are some areas where the summer breeding areas in yellow and the orange, and a little bit towards the west in, in California, in Baja California. But notice how in Mexico, uh, we lose the colors and it's full of, of question marks. So as a scientist, as a scientist, I know 
that this map is gray and full of question marks because maybe we don't have the knowledge in Mexico to know where the butterflies are going through. We don't have data to inform the corridors and maybe we just created a map that is incomplete. That is as a scientist, I can justify this map as a scientist and saying, well, we don't have enough data. But as a human being, as a migrant, as a person um, uh, of Mexican origin, this map is very insulting. This map is very insulting because scientists in United States and Canada took the time to gather all the information in the countries where they speak their own language and took no time to go to gather data in Mexico, therefore creating it as a gray area full of question marks. As a scientist, I hate to see this bias. I hate to see how uh, scientific groups, science groups, conservation groups are willing to leave a whole country out with unanswered questions just because nobody went there to go ask, nobody there to cross the border, to go and connect with local biologists. Nobody sent an email to say, do you have any information? So this is an example where science becomes, uh, has lack of inclusion. Science has this bias where um, they just didn't wanna go down to Mexico. Like it's so clear to me that the question marks do not show lack of monarchs. The question marks show lack of effort for those who were leading that. And that to me, both as a scientist and as a person migrant tell me that's what's happening here. Furthermore, in that green circle, I'll show you kind of a zoom in of that green circle. The scientists who created that map absolutely ignore the system of national parks, biosphere reserves, and voluntary land conservation that happens in Mexico. Had they crossed the border a little bit, they would have visited all those blue and yellow arrows. All of those are protected areas throughout Northwest Mexico, protected by government designation with government staff, with monitoring plans, uh, with biologists specialized in each one of those areas. And all of them uh, present in these photographs receive training to start monitoring butterflies. And so it just took two days of a training to train 25 biologists in Northwest Mexico. And within a couple of months, we had hundreds of records of monarch butterflies from these same places that were question marks. So when we put the effort to go reach out to other communities, to go uh, train other communities and share the resources with other communities, we can really strengthen uh, our research, our science, and our management decisions in many different ways. But not only that, we also are able to connect with local communities where local communities show their own values and show their own interests. You know, right here, uh, just by the simple act of having those monarch wings, all those kids wanted to be scientists. All those kids wanted to uh, learn how to tag and monitor monarch butterflies. They wanted to learn how to create gardens. They wanted to learn how to attract butterflies to their homes. So why don't we do this in other populations? It's just reaching out a little bit. We'll open the door for a lot of different people. Um, and I'll tell you one of the things that was very important for them, specifically all these kids in these photographs, it was that a scientist of color was telling them these stories. It, it matters who the messenger is when you reach out to communities for communities to respond. It matters how you connect with them, what kind of language you use uh, to connect with some communities. Similarly, I have learned as an immigrant, as a new citizen of the United States, I have learned a whole lot from humanitarian and immigrant uh, advocacy organizations and people who have told me about the struggles of, of immigrants throughout uh, history and um, of, of struggle that I didn't know. I came to the United States hired by a university. I came with my higher education. I came speaking English. I came with a visa. So I came with a lot of privilege that made me blind to the struggle of other people. 
So I don't want to be blind to the struggle of other people. So I reach out to other groups, to other experts to tell me about those, about those experiences. It informs my experience. Similarly, when I came to the United States, I learned a lot about the role models that scientists and people in general have here of conservation. You know, I went to biology school in Mexico. Um, I did read a lot of the books published in the United States, but we also have local role models and local examples um, um, that, that I could follow. So when I came to the United States, um, it was very lonely as a person of color, as a scientist, where I worked at a university, where I worked in field uh, projects, where I, walk in, where I worked in uh, protected area campaigns like wilderness campaigns, it was very lonely because everybody was white. And I could not understand how come there was not other people of color um, in, this, in these circles. I came with the privilege of the education. So I fit in to that world really right away. I fit in, I spoke English, I knew my biology, I knew my ecology. So fitting into those communities, to the conservation community was not difficult, but I was still missing something. There was still something that was not very clear to me. And the more I learned about the role models and uh, the inspirators here uh, in the United States, I learned about some specific figures. So I want to uh, first say uh, for, a, for a warning, for a trigger warning, I'm going to share a quote that is uh, extremely racist, that it is very, very uncomfortable for people of color. So this is, this is a, a warning for something that I'm going to present next in a slide. When I learned about the role models uh, here in the United States, I learned of John Muir. I know about John Muir a little bit before, but um, I learned more about how people uh, revere John Muir as the father of national parks, the father of conservation, the founder of the organization where I work, the Sierra Club, and many other things. What's interesting is that what I see here is one, is a quote that most of those people in the environmental work where I first arrived did not know about. And two, that this quote explains to me why I'm so alone in the environmental world, because other people are just not comfortable being part of it. And clearly, uh, some people are not comfortable with people of color being part of it. So the quote reads, a strangely dirty and irregular life, these dark eyed, dark haired, have happy savages lead in this clean wilderness. With this quote from John Muir from the late 1800s, you can see how much judgment there is for people of color, for people who do not look like him, who do not share his culture, who do not share his language or his values. And yet there is very good, uh, there is a very good understanding of the clean wilderness. Um, you know, so there is this, in, in just one phrase, there is this separation between people and nature, uh, and it created a narrative, it created uh, a paradigm in the conservation movement where uh, basically white people created a conservation movement where it was to protect the land from other people that did not look like them. Uh, when I, when I present this quote, a lot of people say, but John Muir was a visionary. And I absolutely 100% agree. John, Muir's, John Muir was visionary. John Muir's goals went into the future and we're still living them. John Muir's vision of conservation uh, went a long ways, but it was very narrow. Within this vision of conservation, many of us are outside. Many of us don't fit that vision of conservation. Many of the people that I've learned from in remote areas in Mexico don't fit that. And yet it is to their credit that some of these endangered species exist. So uh, there is a communication breakdown there where we need to re-understand and we need to acknowledge and integrate into our knowledge that there is no separation between people and nature that there is no such thing as pristine wilderness, that the idea that Europeans wanted to bring here 
and that we continue to perpetuate through our language is that of nature without people. And we think that's the ultimate, that's the ultimate goal, except when we want to bring our hiking boots and we want to go camping and we want to ride our ATV and we want to climb that peak, then we see, we see uh, people in nature. But that's a very narrow view of people. Basically, the people that John Muir did not want to see were, uh, where is my slide? Uh, people like her. This is today. This is what reflects into who John Muir was talking about. And I, um, I disagree. I think she has a great future as a biologist. She can have a great future as a decision maker. She can be president of the United States. Uh, she has the right and the responsibility uh, to, to, to be part of this country. And there is no reason why I would say that her hair, her eyes, or any, any other uh, characteristic of this person would not allow her to enjoy clean air, clean water, open spaces, and a healthy life. Even more, while I'm learning about the conservation movement in the United States, I'm also learning about the efforts of restoration in Mexico that people are doing to protect the rivers, to protect their watersheds, to, uh, to bring water back to some creeks, to make uh, these areas more accessible for migratory species, for local uh, common and endangered species to really benefit the whole system by facilitating uh, the easiest or the most common of resources in order to have life, which is water. So, you know, I'm working on the United States hearing that we need to protect wilderness areas uh, from people. And I'm, I'm, at the same time, I'm working in Mexico and I'm seeing people working in wilderness areas, making them better. So that was 10 years of my work. I'm, I'm, this did not happen in one month or two. This was not one field trip or, or two. This was 10 years of my work to understand that there was two narratives in the area where I live. The narrative of conservation without people that is led by white people and the narrative of conservation by everybody else, which is working in the land to make it better for the benefit of natural and human communities. So then, um, and then another issue arises because a lot of my work with jaguars, with the cameras, with butterflies, I am traveling back and forth between Arizona and Sonora uh, across the border. And while I'm crossing back and forth, the, the issue of border walls and immigration is, uh, is increasing in, in what we know in the country. So, when I work with the wilderness advocates, they used to tell me about this author who was very inspiring, a person who they really, really believe and followed in their, in their vision also. And they really were inspired by what they wrote about Moab, Utah, and uh, the, the, the borderlands and other places. So here's another warning. I'm going to have another quote that is uh, even less friendlier than the last one. Uh, so here we go. And I will read. The quote says, it might be wise for us as American citizens to consider calling a halt to the mass influx of even more millions of hungry, ignorant, unskilled, and culturally, morally, genetically impoverished people, especially when these uninvited millions bring with them an alien mode of life, which let us be honest about this, is not appealing to the majority of Americans. Therefore, let us close our national borders to any further mass immigration. The means are available. It's a simple technical military problem. And the author of this quote is Ed Abbey. Ed Abbey is a very well-known Southwest author, a conservationist, another person who inspires conservationists and the conservation movement. But honestly, I could delete that name and I could say, this quote is by Donald Trump. This quote is by Brett Kavanaugh. This quote is by, uh, I'm, I'm not, Ted Cruz. I'm not even going to say any, any more names. Uh, look at how somebody who loves the environment 
is willing to create a barrier to stop people. And let us also be honest about this, very harshly criticized people because of what they look like. Um, and uh, this person is willing to, you know, just have a, a, a solution that is as simple as a military and technical problem. Well, it is, this was written in the 1970s and today we are seeing the results of these kind of ideas. Today we are seeing the destruction of natural places, of uh, the deserts, of the borderlands, because people came up with the idea, and I won't only credit, uh, others would help protect those places. But look at how comfortable this solution was, because here's a barrier that um, basically it has an end. You can see that if you are a desert tortoise, if you are a pronghorn, if you are a mountain lion, and if you are a person, you can go around that barrier. That barrier does not stop anything. It just creates an illusion of protection uh, for those who want to feel protected by building walls. Uh, what you don't always think of is that the borderlands are not a wasteland. There is this image of the borderlands as just sand dunes and a, and a lonely saguaro standing somewhere. That's not the case. There are mountains, there are deserts, there are rivers. For example, the San Pedro River that flows from the mountains in northern Mexico, it flows north into the valleys of Arizona all the way to the Gila River. The San Pedro River on the north side of the border is a protected area that hosts migratory birds and bats and many other species. From this aerial photograph, you might not know what side is north and what side is, is south. You can see that there's a line in the middle. And I'll tell you this, even if you, were, if you didn't know where you were exactly, if you are flying the borderlands, there is more destruction on the north side. That's how you know where the North is. That's, what, that's how you know where the United States is because of all the roads that have been built, because of all the barriers, because of all the erosion, the destruction that has been allowed by this simple technical military solution. So by having those ideas, we're also affecting populations of animals that used to flow freely to go look for those resources animals that might be looking for water or might be looking for food and now are forced to live um, in places where they might not reach those resources. Important, it's also important to say it doesn't matter if those animals are on the north side of the border or the south side of the border, either way they are stuck, either way they are affected by these kind of barriers. And sometimes this is a, this is a, a photograph on the ground with the San Pedro River, the aerial place photograph that I showed you earlier. And you can see there a border patrol uh, vehicle. You can see what's called a vehicle barrier. And this is a photograph from over 10 years ago. I cannot go to this place anymore. This place now has a huge uh, 20, 25 feet uh, wall. Uh, I cannot see the trees from the other side. And uh, basically this place has been destroyed. They put high power lights and generators. This affects migratory animals. All the construction crews, all the materials, all the time to bring all this also has an effect on the border. And what I'm bringing up here is not only the border itself, but all of this also impacts human communities along the border. Human communities pay the ultimate price of all these barriers because a lot of their normal life was disturbed by this. Not by immigration, not by living in a place where they would have contact in urban areas with people from both sides of the border, but by policies that stop the natural flow uh, and the human flow of everything going on in some of these places. It affects the economy of national parks. It affects the economy of recreation in some of these places. Some people like to believe that all of this infrastructure is necessary because uh, migrants, undocumented migrants, uh, refugees, asylum seekers, all of whom are not the same 
are coming to the United States. Some people justify the destruction of nature uh, and the destruction of human communities because people are coming across the border. So see how a quote from the 1970s turn, turns into the actual destruction of nature. These barriers are not protecting nature. These barriers are affecting nature at a very fundamental level. So here's where equity and inclusion come in. A lot of people think that the border wall was a great idea by Donald Trump. Donald Trump did not have the creativity or the initiative to do this. However, uh, there was a lot of systems put in place for Donald Trump to weaponize and create the racist uh, and, and uh, yeah, and the racist language about the border. In 2005, then President George W. Bush signed an, a law called the Real ID Act. And the Real ID Act has a section, which is section 102, which reads, notwithstanding any other provision of law, that means the law doesn't matter, notwithstanding any other provision of law, the Secretary of Homeland Security shall have the authority to waive all legal requirements such secretary in their sole discretion determines necessary to ensure the expeditious construction of the barriers and roads. Basically what the Real ID Act did is erase all the laws, erase all uh, endangered species law, Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, uh, and Wilderness Act. There is a list of about 50 laws that are waived to build these barriers. So no, they do not need scientific research. They do not need to know the impacts on water. They do not need to understand engineering in this region. They do not need to care about how uh, jaguars or ocelots will cross the border. They do not need to address any other uh, laws affecting human communities because one person can waive all the laws in order to build these barriers. Well, the consequence of that is not only the destruction of nature, but it's also the destruction of those communities. When you build barriers without studies, without engineering, and you go and block, chan block, block tunnels because you think there's no water in the desert, you made a mistake. You created a flood that affected a lot of people that had a lot of material and personal losses. And because there's a law that allows you to not care about these laws, then there's no accountability. All of these impacts are on the Mexico side because it turns out that water was flowing in that direction and when it was, or from that direction, and when it was blocked, um, it affected the Mexico side. So see how, even if you think that you're trying to protect your country, the impact is on other people, on nature, in other places, there is no way to uh, not have an impact somewhere else. That might not have been the intention, but it sure is the impact. And it's very important that you understand the difference between impact and intention. So let me give you some better looking images and, and I will start uh, uh, closing with a little bit more positive ideas. This is a vision that we could share. This is a vision that we can share of nature and people. Everybody sharing their own language, their own values, their own understanding of nature without having to outcompete or leave anybody else outside. This is, these are images from a national park in Mexico where actually children are leading, are guiding tours for tourists who go there. It's not for the children's education for them to protect their area in the future. No, they're actually protecting their area today. They are the experts in the area and they lead these field trips where they show people about the beauty of their home. And so we would do a great service to our own science, to our own advocacy, to highlight the people who are doing that work instead of us scientists always wanting to be in the picture, instead of us scientists or recreationists 
wanting to be at the top of the mountain or climbing the crag or skiing down the hill. Like, let's give credit to other people. Let's show who the local people, where the local knowledge is and how their values and their involvement in conservation positively affect uh, uh, these areas. Because of time, I'm going to share poking your curiosity a little bit to say, if you are curious about learning some of these things locally for, for Utah, I recommend four things. Please go look for uh, the Salt Lake City Air Protectors. There is a group on Facebook, SLC Air Protectors, look for them. Learn about murder and missing indigenous women and girls. This is an issue that affects our country, that affects Canada and Mexico and many other places where indigenous leaders are being killed, uh, especially environmental defenders, and understand why that interaction is happening. Also, learn about Bears Ears, but not as a national monument. Bears Ears has been a national monument just the last 10 minutes, but it has been a sacred area for many indigenous people throughout millennia. So learn a little bit more from those local communities about Bear Sears. And finally, I want to invite you to also learn about the Utah chapter of the Sierra Club. Uh, we are doing a lot of local work that might be interesting to you, that might help you learn more about the application of equity and inclusion in the outdoors um, and how Sierra Club is addressing even our own history. We are not erasing history, we are not um, uh, revising history, we are just acknowledging that there were blind spots in our history that need to be addressed and that it is our responsibility not to change history, but to give a voice and elevate the voices of all those who have been silenced for many, many years. Uh, it is never enough time to talk about equity and inclusion, so I encourage you to continue your, con your conversations and let's get into questions and answers, Roslyn. Uh, I don't know if, let me see. I'm going to look at the Q&A. I see one. Uh, is that okay? Is it okay, uh, Roslyn, Ro Joanna, if I start reading? Yes, please yeah. do. Thank you. So from anonymous attendee, we consider a lot of these people, these people, uh, the fathers of conservation and they are well recognized in this field. The quotes are appalling and I believe bring a bad reputation to the outdoors and our public lands. How do you suggest students, researchers, employees engage in discord against these ideas without engaging in cancel culture of these people? Ah, that is juicy. Um, I did say a, a few ideas. Uh, there's a lot of ways. Let me tell you, addressing equity and inclusion is not a cooking recipe. You don't have the ingredients, put them together, mash them all up, cook them, and then, uh, and then have a product. The product of what you can do on equity and inclusion depends on who you are, depends on your layers, as I described my layers as an onion, Depend, depends on what your background is, where your family is from, who are your friends, who you grew up with, what values you share with people, what networks, what friends do you have, what kind of foods do you eat? What you can do in equity and inclusion depends on you, but only you can discover it. Um, so a few things I did in this, in this talk is, for example, I used very specific language. The easiest thing uh, for me to understand, it is not the easiest thing in pe for people in the United States to understand is, I don't call people in the United States Americans uh, for a couple of reasons. One of them is because America is a whole continent all the way from Alaska to Argentina. So people in Argentina, in Brazil, in Chile, in Honduras, in Costa Rica, we're all Americans. The rest of us hate it when people in the United States identify themselves as Americans. So that's language. But not only that, also notice how people in the United States will identify Native Americans, African Americans, Latin Americans, Asian Americans, but the Americans are always just white. We never say white Americans or European Americans. They're just Americans. And so there are things in our language that we need to change in order to um, 
make more space for other people. Examples in outdoors and recreation. Recreation is only one value of enjoying nature. In fact, calling it outdoors says that you live indoors, that you believe your life is indoors, and that when you go outdoors, you go out to play. But some of us live with an indoor, outdoor life, learning experience, family, uh, travel, etc. So I never use the word outdoors because I don't see myself like indoors and therefore I, I can qualify when I'm outdoors. It's nature, it's the environment. Uh, it's other, it's other, other words that tell me a little bit more inclusive way of nature. Other things about I wrote about this is, I told you about the pristine wilderness. That doesn't exist. That doesn't exist. That is an image in your mind that, that, that is not true. Uh, when we talk about my backyard, it's not your backyard. It is not your backyard. It is somebody else's land. And it has been historically somebody else's land. It's the same thing when we say, oh, that's no man's land. That kind of uh, phrase is erasure for indigenous communities who have lived in the Yellowstone area, in the Grand Canyon, or in Yosemite for, mil for, for, for thousands of years. So there's things in our language that we can do a little different. Let me read another question. Ah, sharing the recording, I think you will get a link. Uh, let's see some questions in the chat. Uh -huh. Question, what training programs have worked have work to bring equity and inclusion to all who to all outdoor programs, or have you developed change over time? Talk uh, over time talks or approaches that have helped you. Actually, I'll tell you what helps to me. I'm using my my skills. So every time you want to engage in equity and justice, use your skill. My most basic skill is to speak Spanish. I don't need to be a scientist for that. I don't need to nothing. So when Sierra Club or any other organization where I have worked, they say, we want to be more inclusive. How can you help us? Well, let's translate things in Spanish. At least that will help you broaden your audience. Uh, of course, if people are interested in butterflies, I will immediately jump into that. But if they're interested in cats, I can also do that. Those are my abilities. But I also have an ability uh, that is cooking. And if you can connect with people through food, if you can share people's food, if you can understand people's history through food, that is a really good way to learn from other people. Another way, uh, right now in March, we are just celebrating Women's International Day and Women's Month. So, you know, it happens also with uh, Black History Month or Indigenous People's Day. So we're about to get to Indigenous People's Day and you want to have an event and you are scrambling looking for an Indigenous person to do a talk. Don't do that. Have a relationship with communities, build trust uh, and, and interactions that when you have the need for a speaker, you already know somebody who will do it instead of scrambling at the, at the, at the last minute trying to find somebody. Same thing with the manuals. Manuals are men panels, you know, when a conference only invites uh, men to speak on an issue. Uh, if you're a man and you're invited to that, actually, whomever you are, please ask who else is on the panel. I have said no to many panels because there's only men sitting in those panels. I don't like manuals. That is very irresponsible. So if, if I get that opportunity and I say, no, I'm not going to uh, be part of this manual, but I suggest this person who is a great speaker, has the expertise, then I'm using my privilege to open the door for somebody else. Those who invited me trust me, and I use that trust to say, I think you should invite other people. Sierra Club is working on a theory of change in order to uh, really have uh, not a formula, but a way to address lack of equity and inclusion in our conservation work, in our justice work. You might have been noticing that uh, we have a lot of different initiatives we're supporting local communities. And so um, some of those, if you approach your local Sierra Club, you might have some, some uh, suggestions there too. Let me see. Looks on my end like you've addressed everything I've seen so far. Any additional questions that the audience has for our guest speaker today? I see one more question in here. 
It says, you mentioned the human nature duality that exists in white Anglo culture. Can you share an example from your life or culture of how humans and nature are not mutually exclusive? Yeah. I'm seeing that in the chat. Thank you. One example, and I'll say one fairly visible, is bear seers, is bear seers. Uh, indigenous tribal nations uh, have been uh, looking for uh, the protection of bears ears uh, because it's a sacred area for them. It is part of their origin story. It is part of their culture. It is part of their ceremony. And just protecting bears ears without the understanding of how it is culturally important to people is creating any other park where you think uh, it's just pretty mountains and trees. This is a place where history of humans intersects with nat nat natural history. Uh, you might have seen a few years ago, Standing Rock, it was indigenous communities defending a river. So they were not defending a bank account. They were not defending uh, a capitalistic model. They were defending their livelihood. Border communities, indigenous border communities are defending their borderlands uh, from explosions and destruction of sacred places. Women went to jail uh, trying to stop bulldozers. That is uh, because they are willing to put their life on the line. Unfortunately, that should not be, uh, that should not be the case. And it is admirable, but it is still sad to have to say that they are willing to put their life on the line to defend the land. Many times we might not see the values that they see. We might not understand uh, that connection to nature, but it is important that we uh, uh, understand that it is important for other people. So here's, here's one quick formula that I've been using recently to understand some of these things. When we are born, and especially in this country, we are told uh, you have a right to nature. You have a right to vote. You have a right to clean water. You have a right to clean air. All of them true, but I want you to test this and give it some thought. Instead of you have the right, how does it feel if you say you have a responsibility? You have a responsibility to nature. You have a responsibility to vote. You have a responsibility for clean water. When you have the right, it's just like, I can go take because it's my right, such as those who stormed the Capitol on January 6th. They think they have the right to democracy instead of having the responsibility to democracy. So if you change your view and you have a right to nature, you can start seeing nature as, a, as, as the same level as you. You can, you can understand why People believe that trees are also people, that mountains are also people. They're not human people, they're mountain people. They are tree people, they are river people. And that way you create a relationship where you understand that clean air gives back to you and you give back to clean air. That water's flowing, that trees, protecting trees and protecting sacred places is a true way relationship instead of the capitalistic Western way of seeing things to take and never leave anything behind. So that's a quick, that's a quick idea that I've been using in my mind. Uh, and instead of having this right, I have a responsibility and it has helped me um, uh, address some things too. Let's see, we answered this one. Yep. There's two more that have come in. Let's see, Colleen, oh, let me see. I'm gonna read. Uh, thank you, Colleen. Thank you, brother, for sharing your knowledge and experiences and acknowledging the racist nature of John Muir and Edward Abbey. Have you been asked, invited to a board DEI committee and what has been your response to those requests given that this request may be considered tokenism? Yes, that's my life. And in fact, uh, first off, thank you for your question, Colleen. Uh, uh, it means a lot, it means a lot that you are here. I'm invited to these things all the time, not only because I'm, uh, uh, I'm, I'm very outspoken. This is what I mean when embracing the discomfort. I'm really good at making white people feel uncomfortable. And so they invite me to things like those. But it doesn't mean that when I'm in the room, 
Just my presence doesn't change anything. So when people talk about boards or committees and they're like, we need to diversify our board. And so they bring one or two uh, people of color or people with different abilities. Diversity not only is ethnic diversity, it is also abilities, it is also other things. Um, me sitting at a table does not address equity. Me sitting at a table only addresses diversity, but that's not the end goal. The end goal is inclusion, is the fact that I can sit at the table and have my voice heard and have my values understood and respected so they are as important as the values of everybody else at the table. This happens a lot with scientists. We feel that scientists have the ultimate knowledge that is being published. I have all the diplomas. I presented at the conference. Therefore, my science should be the way to make decisions. And it's not. We also need to understand that non-scientist people have knowledge. I can talk about my grandma and my aunties, how they're not scientists. And yet, I have learned so much more um, about life from them. So. Uh, it's important that we not only focus on diversity, but that we focus on creating space that allows everybody else to be present, to be heard, to be valued, and to be respected. And earlier, when I talk about the environmental community, I said, I felt alone, but I fit in. And this, I, I planted it there very purposefully because I want you to understand this other part. It's different to fit in than to belong. And if you really want to create equitable spaces and inclusion, don't let people just fit in a role that you want them to roll. Don't let them fit in because they have the gear or the backpack or the pants or the Patagonia jacket that everybody else have. So they fit in with the group. Make them belong in that group. Make them feel comfortable as whom they are with their own accent, with their own knowledge, with their own story, with their own cultural values. So what you're looking for is creating spaces that are welcoming for people to belong, not to fit in. And that will help you uh, as you move forward in creating diversity and inclusive spaces. Finally, I will also say, that my role in these committees or boards depends on who the audience is. If the audience is white, I need to help this audience understand some of the biases, some of the implicit bias and, and blind spots that we have. But if my audience is people of color, I want to help them elevate their voices and their values and tell their stories. So also my own personal role varies depending on who the audience is. This same presentation, I would do it very differently to fifth graders. It's, it's very similar to that. Not too differently. Uh, thank you for that, Colleen. Should we keep going, Joanna? Yes. Excellent. We still have people on, so keep going. How would you recommend people agitate within white dominated environmental organizations when official leadership is very resistant to any change? Well, that's, that's where we live. Um, uh, we don't have to stick with it. We, it doesn't have to be like that all the time. But the more we raise our voices, the more we disrupt the paradigm or the narrative existing, the more we are elevating uh, um, other values and other voices. Sometimes it has to be you. Sometimes you might open the door for somebody else to do it. What is very important to know is that you need to know who you are first so then once you know who you are and your identity and your intersections, then you'll be able to help. Um, because as a man, I am also focused at disrupting the patriarchy. My role as a man also has to do not only with ethnic diversity, is with telling men of my own ethnicity that we must do better and change the systems that are patriarchal, uh, that don't allow women to have equal voice or an equitable voice to the rest of our to the rest of issues in society. That if men in leadership positions don't understand that uh, uh, women need space and parents parents 
need time and space to raise their children and take some time off from work, we are not making it equal or equality for everybody. We're not working on equity. I need to tell men that when we use certain words that are discriminatory to women, that breaks uh, whatever good intentions we have. I need to tell men that we need to care about the, the impact of our words and our behaviors and not just be like, oh, but my intention is great. I have a mother and I have a sister and I have a daughter, so I want the world to be better. I also want men with no sisters and no daughters to make the world better for women. So I want other people to make the world better based on their privilege for everybody else. I don't have sisters and I don't have daughters. And yet I'm very focused at making the world more inclusive for women and femmes. That's another thing. I don't want, I'm trying to break this idea that everything is binary. There's only men and women. There is machismo and feminismo. And that if you support uh, Black Lives Matter, you hate everybody else. And that if you support um, um, uh, people of color, you don't like white people. And if you elevate women, you don't like men. There is no, that we need to do away with that binary way of thinking because it puts us that's what corners us into having to think in that either you're with us or against us. Learn about the spectrum between, um, in between and, and, and you'll be a better communicator and you have a better role. Ooh, that was a long answer. Before I jump into the next question, I actually want to address cancel culture. Somebody there asked cancel culture. Cancel culture is this concept, it's not a culture and it is not a movement. It is just a concept that comes from people thinking in binary ways. So a lot of people think that at Sierra Club, we are canceling John Muir because we are bringing up this criticism to his writing and we are bringing up this criticism to his views. We're not canceling John Muir. Our, our computers still have John Muir servers. Our buildings are still called the John Muir building. Everything at Sierra Club is John Muir. So this is not either you love him or you hate him. Either you revert him or cancel him. We are in between. We are learning the complexities of this person and the impacts of what this person said and expressed. There is no such thing of cancel culture when you understand that life is not binary. So if you only think in binary terms, to you is either check mark or X out. And so that's the cancel culture. It is not a thing. It's just a reflection of a binary way of thinking. Ooh, that's the first time I answered that question, by the way. Uh, I would say also for agitating within white dominated spaces, I would say, be safe. See who you are and uh, be safe based on your identity. Because sometimes some people cannot go agitate everywhere. I personally don't go to protests because I feel that I can get in trouble because of my big mouth very easily. So I, my support and my advocacy is different. So be safe in the way you agitate. Okay, Blanca, as a queer Chicanx working in the outdoor field in Southern California, I always hear white folks generalizing and stereotyping Latinx as being dirty and polluting the land. I can see the impact of ongoing settler colonialism on this. Can you speak to it further? Uh, yes, I can. I'm going to need another three hours on that. But I absolutely see, yes, it is. This is, the, this is a reflection and an outcome of that idea that, uh, dirty, that dirt is dirty. Uh, I recommend a book called uh, uh, White Environmentalism. I look, for, I look for the title, but Clean Wilderness, A Clean Wilderness. It is this idea that People make it dirty, uh, even for people enjoying nature. If you have music, then you are somebody else. Uh, if you're quiet, then you are in the right group. You know, like if you're wearing hiking boots, then you know what you're doing. But if you're wearing flip flops, you shouldn't be here. If you eat granola, oh yeah, you're a, you're accepted in the culture. But if you eat tamales, they will look weird at you. Like why are you eating that? And so. This is what has, created, uh, has been created from a narrative of exclusion. Instead of uh, understanding that enjoying nature is, some, is something for everybody in their own way, 
Some people have created a way of thinking that if you enjoy nature, you only enjoy it like this. So yeah, it is unfortunate um, that people have that kind of, kind of um, opinions. I suggest if you don't already, that you hang out with your group, that you create and continue building on your culture, show how the Latinx culture is an environmental culture, especially in Southern California, tell them where the lettuce and the tomatoes and everything else comes from and how people working in the fields uh, have been on the forefront of the environmental movement because of their work on pesticides, because of the work on water management. Um, so yeah, environmental work is not just protecting the panda bear and the jaguars and the whale and saving Yellowstone. Protecting the environment is also protecting our families, responding to threats of the pesticides, of pollution, of air pollution, water pollution, uh, addressing health issues like asthma in uh, air polluted cities, uh, randomly anywhere. So that is also environmental work. And we need to show that uh, there's a diverse ways of addressing these type of things. All right, thank you so much, Blanca. Claudia Radel, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation that touched on so many important questions. I very much enjoyed it. Thank you, Claudia, gracias. Uh, Whitney Lee, do you have any environmental idols or inspirators from the early 1900s that are indigenous or people of color that represent yourself and other oppressed groups better? Oof, well, that's, a, that's an amazing question. Quick, quick answer, I don't. Quick answer, I don't. Uh, and there's several answers, there are several reasons for that. One is that uh, my awareness is very recent. I actually can tell that I'm still developing a person and learning a lot of this. So I haven't learned enough, talked enough, read enough to have, um, to have heroes or sheroes from, from the early 1900s. But I can tell you is that the generations before the current generations that defended Bears Ears, the generations before the current generations that lived in the Grand Canyon, that lived in the Yellowstone area, in Yosemite, that live in, the, in uh, what is now Standing Rock. Right now, those descendants are following the footsteps of their ancestors, defending those lands and those waters. They are my heroes and sheroes. They might not have faces. They might not have names. They definitely didn't write books like, like John Muir did, but they represent cultures and they represent a vision of people as a whole moving forward in their culture. Currently though, I wanna share one hero I have uh, and his name is Raul Grijalva. Uh, I invite you to look for Raul Grijalva. Uh, Raul Grijalva is a person of color. Raul Grijalva is an immigrant, a uh, citizen of the United States. Raul Grijalva is a representative of District 5 of Arizona. Raul de Grijalva is a congressman whose agenda to be a congressman is the protection of the environment. Uh, and Raul Grijalva happens to be a decision maker who is the chair of the Natural Resources Committee in Congress. So many heroes don't write books. Many heroes don't give talks. And they're not in the forefront of these movements, but are cultivating the movements. My heroes and my sheroes are my grandmas who taught me how to cook my aunties who taught me how to, uh, how to do a lot of things. My heroes and my sheroes are people who didn't write books, but who are sharing their knowledge through histories, through ceremonies today. Um, so those are some of them, yeah. Are we good in time? Well, I wanna thank you, Sergio. There have been comments coming in of how much people enjoyed your seminar. It was powerful. You provided us with a lot of insights and perspectives that will be grist for further conversations and actions among our own community. So thank you for being here today and for what you have shared with us. I want to respond to a couple of the questions. People have asked where the recording can be found of the seminar afterwards. Please go to the page that has all of our seminars listed under tabs. The easiest way to get there is to go to the Depart Department of Environment and Society homepage, 
and click on the current speaker. It'll take you right to that page. And all of the speakers are listed at the bottom under tabs. The registration link will change into a recording link soon after. So look for the recordings from this and other seminars that we've had. But the page for Sergio, I want to point out, has a lot of articles about and by Sergio that you might find very interesting. So there's a lot more information there on the page for the talk from today. So please visit that website to learn more. Thank you. Thank you for being here. We still have 45 people online, so hopefully they can uh, virtually wave to you and thank you for being here.